we'll give a couple of minutes for uh, all to join. The people are joining now as we start the session. Mm -hmm. Jackie, thanks for joining. Thank you, Santosh. Sorry, it was a bit delayed. I was just on the chapter leaders meeting, oh, so. We are good, we are good. We have Deason on the call. Uh, he's going to present us the session for us now. Oh, good. Let us give one minute uh, and then we'll get started. Uh, will the people join on the call? Uh, to the people who have joined so far, uh, your mic is unmuted uh, so that you can ask the questions to uh, Deason as we, we go ahead. Normally, we keep the video and audio mute, but in this particular uh, webinar, we have a format wherein uh, your mic will be uh, will will be will be on so that you will be able to participate with your questions. Yeah, so let us uh, get started. Good evening and uh, welcome you all to the webinar hosted by the Ireland chapter of PMI. My name is Santosh Joshi, Director of Events, and I will be your host today. This webinar is being recorded for the future reference. Before we commence, let me inform you that there is going to be a special announcement towards the end of this webinar. Our president, Jackie Fagan is going to share you the news later in the event. Stay tuned and look forward to the special message. COVID-19 has accelerated the digitalization process. Digitalization is not an option now. It is a business mandate to remain competitive in business or rather to remain in business. What exactly is the digitalization process? What challenges the digitalization process faces compared to the other programs? Let us hear directly from the industry expert, Deason. So, okay, hope you can see the in my next slide. It is moving. Okay. So Deason uh, is honors degree in electronics engineering and a doctorate in biomedical electronics. He worked in Ireland too, both in the industry as a head of school of engineering in the Waterford RTC. Established first ever engineering degree in Southeast of Ireland. Established earliest EU funded academic exchange program in the region, in the regional college system with the institutions in, ben, in uh, Belgium and Luxembourg. Consulted and trained globally in the project management field. He established Scatterwork in 2008. He serviced many customers with uh, the marquee client base includes DSM, GE, Damco, Airbus, HP, Zurich Financial Services, Volvo, CERN, etc. Santosh, can I just interrupt you for a minute? We're not actually seeing the slides. OK. One. Great, okay. thank you. Hopefully. Fine. Yes, that's fine. Thing. Yeah, OK, so uh, he also held a lot of uh, uh, volunteer, uh, uh, the global roads for PMI also. So we are glad to have him present the PMI session for the Ireland chapter of PMI. He also is an author of overview of the book or uh, PM book guide also. Listen, it is our pleasure to have you today with us. I request you to take it forward from here. Well, thanks very much for the very generous introduction. Um, I am 
indeed still working uh, as a volunteer for PMI and I'm working with the Educational Foundation and I've been nominated to a group in Germany for this year uh, to do some mentoring for them. So let me just bring up um, my slide set. I just want to check that you can see my screen. Can you see that? Yeah, we can see. Yeah, it I can. Yeah. Okay, so I'll go forward from there. So as I say, thanks very much. It's lovely to be in PMI uh, environment again. Um, so I just want to tell my, my sort of story, how I got here, if you like. Um, I, I did a lot of projects over the years and somewhere in the middle of my career, I looked back and I thought, well, actually, that's what I'm doing. And um, then I've been involved in that um, since actually more or less since I, I moved out of the regional college system and I've been doing it in lots of places. And this man here is a client of mine and um, he, what he did is we were running a set of workshops for his di division and he wanted to emphasize it was really important. And he brought in at the last 20 minutes or so of one of our workshops over several days, he brought his entire management team walking in and it was like a, a sheriff, you know, that you see in a Western film or something like that. And he came in and then he said, listen to what you get on this program. It will save you 20 years of learning. So that's what we do is, you know, the, the further you're, you're around, the longer you're around, the more you learn, the more you've got to share and so on. And basically that's a, an easier way to learn is to, 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 to talk to people who've done things usually with a bit of luck and we try and do that. So that's where the sort of style of thing that we're doing. Um, I just put for completeness um, various sectors. Um, does anyone, is anyone in a sector that they don't see listed there? If they did either either shout it out over the microphone or put it through the chat. OK, I seem to have covered it all. We're, but basically we work across all sorts of technical and technological environments. And we've worked in a lot of different countries, um, mostly between here and New Zealand, um, with occasional uh, trips to Canada and United States and South America and so on, and North Africa as well. And here are various companies which you heard about already and the team that I have, it's it's a single team. So I always say that a project, you know, you can't have a, a core team of 25 people. You've got to have a core team. And the, the magic number that I heard was somewhere between five and seven. And if it's too small and somebody goes away because they're ill or something like that, then you lose too much of your capacity. And if you have too many people, you never make good decisions because people miss meetings and so on. So that's my magic number. So they're a great team and they live in various different countries from United States to Belgium and Germany and so on. OK, and that's what we do um, at the end. Um, I'm just going to say that I'm going to give you a couple of codes at the end. And there are two things there that might be interesting to PMI people. One of them is that you may know people who want to do PMP and we, we do it uh, online. And one of the formats is two evenings a week over five weeks. And we do a reduction for PMI members, which I'll give you later. And then we do group coaching in projects. Like that's not learning for uh, an academic learning. That's for the actual project you're working on. And uh, that's what we do. So um, this is we're beginning now to get into the topic. So uh, the title is launch your digitalization strategy. But actually, from point of view of presenting it, I want to do it in a different order. I want to do uh, talk about digitalization first, what it is, and then talk about strategy, what strategy is, and then talk about launch. So I, I hope you'll come with me in that. So that'll be the format. I say questions and answers at the end, but it would be really, really good if the questions come out while we're talking. Um, so uh, either by typing them in or by talking, um, because otherwise it becomes a monologue rather than a discussion. Um, so that's the same comment. Please engage interactively. And uh, uh, Santosh has, has kindly said he'll scan the messages coming in and tell me and some of them I'll answer straight away and some I'll answer at the end and so on. Sure. So there you go. So that's very good. Any any messages so far from anyone? Any comment? Santosh? So far, uh, all good. Uh, Great. No comments yet. Great. OK, so let's move forward. So this is where we're starting and going into discussion. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is what is digitalization? Hmm? And, uh, you know, like everything, you can find it in a book or a dictionary somewhere and people tell you about it. Um, but digitalization means the way that I understand it, it means that you you convert your business processes so that they're all digital. 
So I give you a negative example. Um, I did an application for an unnamed um, government organization recently, and we had to print out the form, sign it by hand, scan it, and then email it back again. <laughs> so obviously that's not very digital. But if, for example, the whole process had been a form that you fill out on screen, um, there could have been some verification process and so on. Um, so you can see immediately that if things are in the digital sphere, then clearly they can just go anywhere around the world and they can be attended to. They can go on to the next step of the process and so on. Now, digitization means converting something into a digital format. So you might have an old photograph of your grandmother or something like that, and you say, oh, we'd like to keep this. So you scan it and then you have an electronic copy. But it, it's not a process. It's just there if you need it. Um, and digitization is the way that you get information into the system so that you can have digitalized processes. So I'd like a, maybe I could ask a poll. How many people would would sort of say yes, they broadly agree with that? And if you don't, then well, please, please tell us what, how you would reword that or how you see it or how it is in, in the company or the place that you're working. Maybe people use slightly different uh, terminology there. So I'm asking that everyone would put in a cha either a chat message or turn on the microphone. Do, do you broadly agree with that? And if yes, say yes. And if no, say no. And uh, then we'll just get a move on from there. Any messages so far? Oh, we are getting a message as yes. So they agree with the definition, Addison. OK, OK. I seem to have got that one right. So <laughs> OK. So let's move on from there. So it's actually a subtle one because that difference doesn't exist in all the languages, you know, and I put in a Z consciously. I would have myself, I would use S instead, like, you know, European English as it were. But um, the, you know, if you look for those things, you, you, you find you miss a lot of the American stuff and like so many things it happens over there. OK, so digitization converts data into a digital form. So I've just said that. So two examples there. One is a digital photo. Hmm? And um, once you've got the photo, you can do things like making it, you know, brighter or darker or rotating it or, you know, making it fuzzy at the edges or whatever you want to do. That's the processing, but you can't do that until you've actually got a digital photograph. Hmm? And I mentioned the Kodak. Does anyone remember Kodak? I mean, when I was younger, everyone had a camera and yeah. and they all had Kodak. Not all. There were two big companies, but Kodak was one of them. And you buy the film and and they did it. And whatever happened, they were dominant in the market. And then they just sort of lost the run of it. Anyone remember Kodak? Yeah, I remember Addison. We used to buy the Kodak <laughs> films go around with the camera. Very good, yeah. And then another example of digitization is audio. So again, um, if we go back not all that long ago, um, recordings were analog. I mean, when I was young, as the saying goes, um, it was a disc that turned around and you had a needle in, in, the, in the slot and so on. And then the next stage up was when they started having um, tapes, really big tapes. And then they got these mini tape, the cassettes, which probably most of you are familiar with, even if you haven't used them. And again, it was still it was still analog signal. Um, so, you know, it worked and, and so on, but it wasn't digitized. And if you wanted to digitize and, and deal with and make them louder or softer or cut out background noise or do all those sort of signal processing, you would need to digitize the, the, the analog signal. And once you've got it in, you can start digitalized process. So then I've got um, a couple of examples here of digitalization um, processes that use the digitalized data, uh, digital data. And one of them is DAB radio. And I'm sure everyone's familiar with how, it, how uh, uh, what the DAB radio is there. And maybe you never gave it a thought how it actually works. But what they do is that each each um, station codes all the, the signals that they're sending out. So these days it's not just the sound, but it's also things like the name of the program and the time and all that sort of thing. And then they feed several of those to a sort of converter, if you like. And then you end up with one signal that has all of the transmission in it, maybe 10 or 15, something like that. And then that gets broadcast. So it's a digital signal and it has all of them together. And then when it gets into your receiver, 
you say, well, I'm interested in listening to RTE2 or whatever, and it filters that out and then it reconverts it. So um, the, the entire transmission thing is done digitally. And what that means is that if you get the signal then then and re -com -com reform it, you know, you get the high quality that you had at the beginning. And um, it means as you move around, uh, that they can get more stations into the same bandwidth and so forth. So that's one example. Another example that I know of is hearing aids. Um, a, near where I live, there's a hearing aid factory and we were, were a group of engineers, we went around and they, what they do is they say that you take the analog signal and you digitize it and then all the wonderful things they do make this signal louder and that one softer and cut out the background noise and all that sort of stuff is done digitally, which is really fantastic in such tiny instruments that, that use tiny, tiny batteries. And then it's reconverted into an analog signal. And if you, if you have expensive hearing aid or a cheaper one, it actually has the same chip in it. And what they do is that they disable part of the program for the cheaper ones, but the actual chip is the same chip for all of them. So those are two examples that I know. And then I'm just going to bring up a third one, um, which is pretty common these days, is building information modeling. And again, can I just ask, is anyone online who's familiar with that, who's heard of it or is using it in your business? BIM, it's an American standard. And if you're not, please put in a comment which says no, rather than just being silent. Uh, there, have we anyone among the people there that are familiar with it, know that it exists and so on? So far, we're getting all the responses says no. Listen. No. OK, so the way that very simply the way it works is this. If you think about it, um, you know, when you design a building, you have to sort of choose what locks are going into the door and what door am I going to have and, you know, what color paint and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And then there may be things to do with, say, calculations like the heating. Why do we have this size of heater? And they do that based on heat loss and, you know, average temperature in that location and so on and so on. And Sorry, can I just ask, I think somebody must have a microphone on and there's noise in the background. Whoever it is, it might be really helpful just to turn off the microphone unless you're actually talking. Thanks for that. Yeah. So what happens is that in the old days, all of that information went missing. The, the architect designed the building, the building got built and then people walked into it and there was no connection. And then that makes it very difficult. For example, if you want to do maintenance on the heating, you don't actually know when it was done or why they use that particular type of heating and so forth. So <clears throat> the BIM, what it does, it does a digital model of the building that sort of belongs to the building all the way through its lifetime. And in theory, you know, it could be 30 or 50 years or 100 years, you know. Um, so that's a standard. And again, that, that would be completely impossible um, you know, unless you had a digitalization of the processes. So let me just stop there for a minute and ask if anyone has any comment on any of those things that I've spoken about now, Digita digitalization, digital signal or digitalized um, processes, and then the various examples I had, any other examples, or indeed, are you involved in it at all? Or is it something you've, you've heard of? Or are some of you involved in it because you know it's part of your job? Maybe I just stop for a moment and see if any comments come in on that. Hi, Dajun, it's Jackie here. Um, yeah, yeah, Jackie. Just I, I typed in no, and then as you were going on, you were talking about the mm. factory and you talk about the heating. I yeah. actually did come across it. I worked for a company mm. called Glambia in the States. I worked mm. there for about a year mm. and a half and they mm. had a cheese factory. I was doing a project, uh, an mm. MIS, Management Information System project. Yes. And when I went to the, um, at the, as part of it, I had to work in the factory, but they brought me mm. on a tour of it. Mm. And they had all these modeling things, like these huge mm. big vats and everything, all all these, um, mm. these. It's, it was like an information system mm. modeling. Is that what this is? Yeah. Where, it's it's a standard so that obviously if you don't have a standard, every building would be done differently and that, and then half part of the, the benefit would disappear. So it's an American standardized format, if you like, that matches this particular usage. Mm. Yeah, and that's what they were measuring on. Like, mm. so they had loads of analytical data around mm. sort of the capacity, the, the temperatures, yeah. like, so they were all very much like each other. 
Yeah. It's a minefield. Of yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I give you a negative example. I worked years and years ago in Tala and we were making telecoms equipment and we bought it from Yugoslavia. And then when we wanted to change the design for different frequencies or something, we discovered they forgot to buy the design. So we, we got the manufacturing instruction, but not the design. And we had to actually redesign from scratch. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So you, you, but I mean, people have been doing that with buildings for years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, so when you think about it, say, gee, it doesn't. Another place where they use this idea, it, I don't know if anyone knows, but is railway trains. You know, you, you normally have maybe five or seven coaches that will all stick together, you know, with a, a driver's place at both ends and so on. And um, that that set of coaches will, will also have a digital model and then it'll have things like, you know, which door and, and when did the door get stuck and, you know, when did they fix the toilet, all, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, after so many years, did they refurbish it and so on. And that that model um, sort of belongs to the to the physical object. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And okay. uh, listen, Ronan yes. is bringing a point that there is a, he's seeing a big push to move digital signature document, a document approval over the last couple of years. Absolutely. And I mean, that, as I say, it, it, it's really absurd some of the things that you do. I don't know what it, but let's just say it's a driving license or something. And you get a document that's physical and then you're expected to print it out, fill it out by hand and then rescan it. And I mean, you, you know, the time that that takes and the errors that it brings in and the effort that it takes compared to having a thing. And of course, it's mindset stuff, because in the old days, when when AC power came out first, um, they discovered that, you know, if you use AC instead of DC, you can put the generator miles and miles away from the, the, the place where you're using the power. That's one of the advantages because you can increase the, 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 um, the, the voltage. Hmm? And then uh, what they found was that in factories, what they did is they put in a, a, a really, really big electric motor somewhere. And then they had bands and pulleys and like, like they did when they had steam engines. And apparently it took about 20 or 30 years before people realized, actually, you don't need to do that. You can have a little electric motor here and then another little electric motor over there. And it's the same with us. You know, anything at all that is a process that you have to do it on paper, you say, why? You know, everyone has a phone, you know. So documents, that's that's it. And of course, we're project managers. That's why we're here. And a project, the worst thing that can happen with a project is that um, you use the wrong version of data. And the only way you can do that is by having a version that everyone can see and it sits in the cloud. Uh, or you put up with delays, like, you know, or you put up with mistakes. And I was on, um, I was working with some power engineers in Berlin a year or two back, and we were talking about project risks. And they said the biggest risk is that you don't have full time, uh, so real time, total access to all of the project data from your phone. Now, five years ago, you, you thought you were lucky if you had um, a, a Wi-Fi, you know, but now it's, you know, it, it's what you expect. OK, thanks for the comment there. Are there any more comments there, Santos, or should I keep moving? Oh, let us keep moving. OK, good. So top benefits of BIM. This is a, there's a report there. If, if you get the slides, you'll be able to click on and have a look. But we've we've got a flavor. So the second topic uh, I wanted to move on to about it. Why now? And this is we're coming at it from a different direction. But I believe I, I looked this up and apparently it took thousands of years for wolves to be selected and turned into dogs. <laughs> And being a great dog lover myself, I have a dog that looks not unlike that one there. And uh, although that's not my dog, but it took thousands of years. And the same with plants, you know, I mean, the the, the, the biggest uh, grain in the Western world, I think, is wheat. And, you know, that itself, it came from various grasses and they were selected over generations and so on. And it took thousands of years. And then as time went forward, things they went faster. So, for example, the slide rule, I don't know if anyone remembers the slide rule, but you could do multiplication by moving two sides of a slider. I mean, I, I use that. My father taught me to use that and they were invented in 1622. And um, I, I actually started working in 1973. <laughs> so I actually started working with slide rules and the first handheld calculator came out the year that I started working, but it only took 350 years. <laughs> you know, compared to whatever we saw on the previous slide. So what tends to happen is that um, things are going faster and faster the whole time because the more tools that you've got, 
then the quicker you can do the next. So if you've got a handheld calculator, you can do things faster than if you have to do them with a slide rule. And then, of course, if the communication is also electronic and like we are today, I have an idea and you see it two minutes later in your email and so on, uh, it goes faster and faster. So I don't know, has anyone else got an example of a, a technology which has a lifetime that, you know, that has been, you know, very short? I've just given a couple of examples there, but things where the, the lifetime maybe of, of a technology has, you know, it's come and it's gone. Nobody? Yeah, one thing I can remember is the floppy disks. Then oh, that yeah, yeah, okay, the okay, yeah. Now the CD is hey. replaced by the memory sticks, so that is changing very fast. Absolutely. I mean, there's a friend of mine who remembers the, the floppy disks. I think they were, they were in inches in those days. And I seem to remember it was 10 or 12 inches or something. But, they, you know, those, you know, they wouldn't be in a museum today, <laughs> you know, but they're completely gone. Okay, that's a good example. So why is it relevant? I think you made this comment at the beginning. If you don't digitalize, you will become obsolete. In the old days, you used to assume you learned something and it was valid for your whole career. And, you know, there might be little changes here and there, but basically you could sort of say, well, I've been a student, I've, you know, now I just sort of do it. And because these lifetimes are much shorter and shorter and shorter compared with the life of an individual, you, you can't expect to go to the end of your career with the skills that you had at the beginning because they change. I saw a list last week that was done and it picked out three or four hundred job titles um, and then it listed them. And what were the ones that were most likely to disappear over the next five or ten years? And the, the most threatened one was, turned out to be a butcher. And there's a lot, apparently there's a lot of things that butchers that do. You can do it with a machine or you know, artificial intelligence or you know, a robot or whatever. Hmm? And um, so then, you know, there's no point in being a butcher because the job disappears. You know, you might as well be in data science or something, It'd be much better. OK, and then, of course, the other thing is that if you don't, the other guys will do it. So you, you lose out anyway. So it's quite different to what it used to be, say, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, or say in my father's time, as the saying goes. Um, you know, in his time, he did his studies and then he had more or less the same technology the whole way through. You, it just doesn't work that way anymore. And digitalization actually enables several technologies that are all maturing at once. So the, the picture gets very complicated. And I've got here a list of them, uh, of things we, we're all familiar, but each of them is a major development in its own right. And all of them are, are sort of held together by digitalization. So the first one is cloud computing. I mean, compared to the old days where you, you you had a computer per company, you know, and if they wanted more memory, they needed to find a room and, you know, put it somewhere. And these days you, you've got a cloud and, you know, you just say, well, I need, you know, three more, you know, uh, people and, and, you know, it all switches on in 10 minutes. Um, so that's one example. Another one, Internet of Things. Um, I was going around an airport uh, maintenance section a couple of years ago, again with a group of engineers. And they told us that what happens these days is that every aero engine is connected live back to the manufacturer. So they know they can tell you, oh, yeah, that engine today it's in China and it's actually, you know, at this height and it's turning at this speed and so on. You know, so the, the connection uh, between machines and, and collecting statistics across a whole range of similar items and so on. And anyone who has um, uh, uh, electric cars, for example, will be familiar with that type of thing. You know, the software gets updated every day or every week. Artificial intelligence, all sorts of things are happening there. Um, things like uh, smart uh, contracts were mentioned to me recently. Medical diagnostics. Um, uh, I saw a report recently where they, they had a particular um, expected disease. It was actually heart attacks. And it turns out that apparently if you take people, say, between 50 and 70 and lots, unfortunately, lots get a heart attack, that about 10 percent of those that look like heart attacks are not. Um, they're, they're people who, who basically have problems, but but they're not caused by the heart itself. 
but it looks the same, you know. And anyway, they, they put autom artificial intelligence on this job and the artificial intelligence was far more accurate in predicting, you know, or, or selecting which patient was in which category than, than at any doctor. So the doctors were a bit miffed about that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, autonomy, the whole idea that you can have something that looks after itself and roves around and, and, and can decide where it is. I saw a very interesting example in a factory where they, they had little robot lorry, you could call them lorries if you like, little transporters. And then they would, you know, you could program, I want to make this, this and this, and it would go over to where the parts were and collect them and load them up and then it would drive somewhere else. And and they were all driving around all the time, missing each other. So you, you couldn't do that at all unless the individual item was autonomous. Cyber security, I saw an application only last week from an unnamed local near com nearby country where they were using it for lie detecting. Um, blockchain, again, anywhere where you want um, a record that is not tampered with. So, for example, in the project area, that would be, be say, if you're doing the type of project where you, you're doing the work for a client. Yeah? So there's a there's a commercial interface between in the middle of the project as well as a as a technical one. And um, what often happens is that the, the big company that has the, you know, they pay the money, so they tell you where to put all the data, but then you don't have access to it. Or if you do, it's under their conditions and so on. And blockchain is great because you can you can put it in the middle as it were belongs to everyone and so on. Adaptive manufacturing, um, 3D replacement of parts, 3D construction of walls. You know, if a part on a machine goes down, you don't have to send it from here to Australia. You, you just sort of program it and at the other end, the, the part gets made and so on. So all of those things depend on digitalization. So let me again stop for a moment or two to pick up any comments or inputs or experiences that any of you have or thoughts in that area. Oh, Christopher, uh, you can open your mic and comment. Uh, he is talking about the wipe VOIPs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, vice over internet protocol. The, the advances over the last couple of years, you don't need a hard line any, any, any more than you can use web based calls to do your business. You don't have to actually physically sit in an office anymore. Yeah. That's absolutely true. And then, of course, you got the cultural change that went with COVID because before COVID, people used to say, oh, well, we're special, you know, we really like people interaction. Of course they do. But, um, you know, the idea of a telephone that you chat um, forever in a day came in, in the, I think, in about the 1930s in America. They brought it in as a, a marketing tool that local calls would be free. You know, in other words, they'd be in the, the subscription you pay per month and that's it. And people used the phone without batting an eyelid. And I mean, I, I had this friend of mine and she was brought up in America and her, you know, she talked to her sister for hours, even if she's in the next house on the phone. And that sort of comfort doing that, but with video didn't really hit us all until COVID. Some people are used to it, but all of a sudden everyone knows that it's there, you know. So thanks for that comment. Any, any other comment? OK, so what happens is that you've got all these Lego blocks, all of these different things I've spoken about, and, and they're all happening at once. So obviously you have a huge number of combinations that you can have. Um, and every time you have a new combination, people do things um, differently, and, and then that can be used as a tool for the next one. And the innovation can be in products, it can be in process, or it can be in business model. And maybe there are other ones as well, but there are three. And um, just to pick an example, when the iPhone came out first, which developments did it capitalize on? Who can put a finger on that? I mean, before the, before the iPhone happened, nobody wanted one. Then all of a sudden, everyone thought, yeah, they, they understood it immediately. So what, what, what technologies or what issues were, were sort of combined in the iPhone? Uh, Ursula, you can unmute your mic. You can go ahead. I, I think music and photo, Desun, more mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Yeah. It had photo. Yeah. So they had camera. The, yeah, or video. Fact, yeah. And video. Yeah. They had that. And there was another thing they had was a touch screen. If you remember, um, the very early phones didn't have touch screens. They had buttons, you know, like 
like, like a telephone. <laughs> like like then, a Blackberry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then the Blackberry became very fashionable because it the had... Rolling mouse bars. Clap. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and oh yeah, hey, you're showing your age. <laughs> 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 and then um, the touchscreen, what was interesting was that before that, there were they had Windows phones. I had one myself. And of course, the window was very tiny because the phone was tiny. And you had to think about a bit like a pin. And you, you were supposed to sort of hit the right pixel. <laughs> and it just got, but the, the clever thing about the iPhone, and one of them was that you had um, the uh, icon, and the icon was big enough you could touch it with your thumb or your finger. Hmm? Yeah. And that was a key issue, the touch screen that did that. And then obviously the speed and how you know how long it works on a battery and all that sort of stuff came to it as well. And once people saw that, they thought, oh, that's obvious. You <laughs> know. And another thing an iPhone did compared to Windows was that Windows doesn't have any delay. You know, you click on something and it works, and you don't click and it doesn't work. But in iPhone, you you get a, an option. You press something quickly and you get one function, and you press and hold it and you get a different function. And that was new as well at the time, if you remember. Um. <laughs> Digitalization opportunities. So um, uh, for business processes, I think we've had some examples that have been mentioned as we go along. I'll bring up the next thing because they, it fits into the same discussion. Business models. Can anyone think of any recent business models that are basically um, digitalized processes? You know, where maybe what they're doing is the same as before, but the, the business is, is digitalized. Any Anyone has it a guess? There's a lot of it going on in accounts payable and accounts receivable with invoicing, mm -hmm. coding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of scanned in as coded on top of it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, on online shopping through eBay and Amazon. Absolutely. I was talking to somebody um, talking about shopping who 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 said that they started out in a in a sort of department store and the model that they had was that you had to work out what people wanted, then you had to buy it, then you had to ship it to the shop and then you had to sell it. And the comment was that when they went for a catalog model, that actually the order of the process was changed. You took the order and then you shipped it rather than the other way around. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But but when you when you go on to online stuff, then the process changes because people they click on they look at a particular product on their iPhone or their phone or whatever, and then they go home and have their tea, and then they switch on their tablet. But because the, everything is networked, the tablet knows that you were looking at that, and it pumps out adverts to you against whatever you were looking at recently, and so on. You know, um, so that the whole sequence is different. That's a completely different business model. Um, and apparently one of the things that has been very successful with Amazon is the fact that they use artificial intelligence to guess what, what you're buying, you know, what you're likely to buy based on your pattern and so on. And there was one case I heard of where they sent um, a, a package to, to a young lady who was expecting and uh, the father received this package that came in the post and he was really annoyed, you know, his daughter wasn't pregnant, but she was. <laughs> so actually, you know, the, the AI got it. Before, before he did, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, life has changed, hasn't it? Okay, let's move on to strategy, and then I want to get on to the to the, the hard bit. So, what is strategy, and the challenge is getting it started. I said launch, and my experience is that if something is new and a lot of people don't know what it really is, and so on, it's extraordinarily difficult to get people to actually make a decision and move forward. Huh? So I've included a couple of slides here. They're more for reference. I'm not even going to go and read them through. But definition of strategy. I'll just read the top bit there. The direction organization takes with the aim of achieving future business success. OK, that's fair enough. And then um, there's another one here. If you look at the middle part, the second one, it says it's a vision where it wants to be. OK, and so on. And then I've got a third one, <clears throat> and it says here, you make logical decisions and develop new goals quickly quickly so quickly it's important because in the old days you, you know you could you could take years to do something but you know that that's not fast enough anymore it's too late mm -hmm. and keep pace it says with evolving technology and business but things don't evolve you know i mean you've only got to look at what's happening in in ukraine i mean that happened overnight you know so, so evolution isn't in it and all of that is moving at once and you're trying to say what are we going to do so here are three 
areas where um, evolution or, or revolution is taking place. So technology and obviously digitalization is a strong force. And then that with the COVID and the change of acceptance and you know globalization and blah, 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 all those things going in together. Market conditions can change very quickly, as we've seen, you know, the euro goes down or the euro goes up and, you know, and all the rest of it. And business conditions, like I said, with with, um, a, you know, for example, with, you know, the, the video conference that we're using now, I was on one only a year ago and it was a business grouping um, and, uh, you know, sort of chamber of commerce type of thing. And there was one person who, who spent 15 minutes interrupting right at the beginning. Oh, I'm not really familiar with it. Do I need to? No, 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 it's not working for me and so on. And I thought, you know, there's 20 people online. You should have checked that before you came online. But that doesn't happen anymore. You know, people know how to use these things. So the challenge is to, to get the thing actually moving so that people buy in and then you start building up experience and then you can have a serious discussion and move forward. So here are some comments of mine. One of them is that if you're early in the life cycle of a technology or something like that, you don't have enough people that you can have a good discussion with them. Um, so that, that slows things down a bit. Uh, it's difficult to have meaningful interaction. It could be that, you know, the people that make the decisions, they, they're all very, very often at the top of organizations, very often older, you know, and they went to college a long time ago and they didn't hear all this stuff and so on. So it can be really, really hard to get a discussion going. And if the, the, the benefit is not in focus, uh, you know, as very immediate, then again, it can be very difficult to get things going. So launching a digitalization strategy is, is so sort of fluffy, as it were, that it can be very hard to get it going. So in my experience, a, a, a project that's driven by a contract, for example, you've got a, I don't know, a heating company and they get a contract to put heating into a new office block, for example. And once they, got, they get a contract, off they go and they do the project and nobody argues about it. Because it, as soon as the, pro, the contract is there, you have a project and people just go and do it. If it's not driven by a contract, it, it can go round and round and round in circles. And the case that I lived was that we, we developed some software and then we wanted to test it. And it happened to be that our users were in America and our company didn't have our division of the company didn't have an office in America. So we needed to borrow a room from another um, uh, division. So the other the head of division said, that's fine, you can use the room. But the head of division himself in America used to turn up at all the meetings. He shouldn't have been there at all. And then he sort of, oh, I don't really like, no, oh, no, I don't really like that. And then what he did was that he used to phone his friend back in Europe and say, well, you know, I, the guys, they're trying to do this, but it doesn't work, you know. You, and then he'd say, oh, yeah, quite right, quite right. And then he would send a message back. So the thing was, you had basically a gate crasher and it was impossible for the project team to sort of make a decision and move forward because, you know, it wasn't driven by contract. It just sort of went round and round. Um, I won't take an example unless anyone wants to because um, I'm looking at the clock here. So the, the trick here, I think, or one of the tricks is get a quick win, get something. And I think that uh, I've got here two things that the first round should be a fairly short, I would call it a project, and it should solve one problem um, and only one, not 99 different ones, and one that people say, yeah, 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 I understand. But there are two deliverables, and one of them is the solution to that problem. And the other one is the last line on my slide there, which is to establish the process. You know, you're building up the community of people who know what you're talking about. And when you come out at the end of this project, you do what you always should do, you know, say, well, this is what we recommend for the next bit. You know, and, and here's what we think. You have a discussion and you have a decision and you move forward. But unless you get into that cycle, um, you know, you can lose time again. So any comments on the strategy side? And the last bit is, is going to be familiar to you all, so I can probably romp through that fairly quickly. But let me just stop in case anyone wanted to add a comment or an experience or a thought on anything we've been talking about. That sounds like, is that a code for no? 
<laughs> I didn't hear yeah. any. Okay, let's move forward. So, okay, so this is the third part, and um, the the obvious suggestion is you set up a a a limited scope project that that you can get buy in for, and I've always said that and it's it's in the famous PM bot guide, but. A project needs really um, a sponsor as well as a project manager. And the way that I would describe it is that the, the sponsor is the sort of senior manager and has can either has the budget or has control or can influence people or something like that. And then the project manager does the work. So you're playing tennis, as it were. Uh, the sponsor says, I want a project that does this and this. And the project manager looks at it and comes back with a, a sort of description saying, I think this is what you said you want, is it? And if the answer is yes, then you start doing it. And if the answer is no, you say, well, what, what did I not understand and so on. But unless you nominate those two people right at the beginning, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work unless you've got both of them. And we, we know that. So I don't think I need to labor that point unless anyone wants. Please feel free to jump in at any stage, of course. Step two. Um, it's interesting, the stakeholders is on chapter 11 or something in the PMBOK guide, just because they didn't want to change the numbers of the chapters. But in the last 10 or 15 years, it has become very, very clear that um, actually stakeholders are the people who define a project, they define what they want, they tell you whether or not they're happy with the results, they know about the risks and things like that. So once you've decided what you want to do, um, it, it makes a lot of sense to find out who these people are and all of them. And I could give one example that I, I, I lived years ago, but we were um, installing a, a mobile telephone network and um, we put a, a physical antenna on the top of a, a block of flats. And one of the people in the block of flats went to the television company and got on the news or on the you know got interviewed and said, you know, from the day they put up that antenna, I've got terrible headaches. You know, so that was a stakeholder who we hadn't considered. And, oh, gee, what do we do now? So we sent over engineers and it turned out that the antenna wasn't even powered up. Uh, but that person was still a stakeholder. And still had power, by the way, and was embarrassing in the sense that, you know, we had to stop and talk and check out what was happening. So stakeholders, anyone who thinks they have an interest, not even that they do have an interest, they think they do. And then um, you can, one way of moving forward is to do a survey. And I've got two things here. One of them is that um, there was an enterprise week, Leo, the local enterprise offices in Ireland, there's one in every county. I think there's 29 offices or something, 29 or 30 of them. And they had this thing, you can look it up on, um, uh, on the internet, drive growth by digitizing your business. But that was interesting because they had um, uh, people who had actually digitized various parts of their business and, and their experience and how they did it and so on. And another thing that you can do is you can do a survey, you know, in the company to collect idea, you know, what are you doing and so on. And what I've done here is I've, uh, I've got um, the MBA thesis from a student of mine, uh, who happens to be in Saudi Arabia, and he gave me permission to mention it here. And his survey, his study was digital transformation in the manufacturing industries. So what I've done is I've included here in the slides, I'm not going to go through them one by one, but I've included the relevant pages from his um, survey. And if the slides are made available to you through, the, through PMI, then you'll be able to download them. And he says he hopes they'd be useful to you. So um, this, here are the sort of things, uh, digital transformation in manufacturing, I'm looking at the left hand side, you know, have you heard of smart factory, you know, have you heard but you don't understand and so on. And then on the right hand side, do you, are you using any of the following technologies, artificial intelligence, big data, blockchain and so on. Uh, so there are, there's about six or seven pages there, they're not very readable in this format, but I've embedded them in the, the slide sets. So the, the PDF, so you can have a look at it. So when you've got some sort of ideas going, um, the, the, the name of the game is probably to do a quick win. And I've the big wheel here, it says um, you don't necessarily just take in an existing process and digitalize it. You might have an opportunity to completely redesign something in such a way that it works much better and much faster and so on. Um, so you might say, well, you know, we need to improve that one, but let's see if we could do it much better. Um, and, and, and pick out what, what you're going to work on. 
whatever you do, if it's customer centric, obviously, uh, in any business, it could be, it could be, by the way, the digitalization is not for the so much for the customer directly, but, you know, for production and so on. But the reason for doing it is the customer. OK, um, if you do this, um, the Leo's again, they have there's tons of money around there and the Leo's, I think they can fund up to something like 300,000 euro per project or something. But they have a system there where they have mentors. Um, I'm actually one, as it happens, uh, for one of the Leo's. And um, these are the five categories uh, that they uh, they fund. Mm -hmm. So they're not saying that the rest is irrelevant, but they're saying, you know, if you, you know, here are some that we think are useful. And, and if the thing that you're looking at falls under one of these categories, you know, then you, you, you'll be able to get some sort of support from them. So then you draw the charter. Um, the two things, as I say, assign the sponsor and the project manager and then specify the first phase deliverable. So they're important. Select one problem and get agreement what the problem is. How to do it is the project. Um, draft a digitalization strategy is a deliverable. So when you get to the end, you, you've got a bit more maturity, you've more people who know about it, and then you can put some sort of draft on the table and get them talking about it. Um, you want to identify the stakeholders because, again, for the reasons we said, um, but to come out of your project with a list that you can rely on. That's pretty good. And then propose a plan for the next phase, which again will be discussed and, and adjusted and so on and move forward. So those are the, the deliverables that I would suggest. And then I would make sure you don't forget the requirements to, to document them, constraints, assumptions, risks and so on and cost and time on like, okay you've got three weeks and we want you to come back with a you know a, a proposal that we can talk about and then the review date you know so don't just say we'll meet at the end of june you know actually look at the diary and pick out the date and then when you've done that project which might take six or eight weeks or something then you come back to the people you use the po political power of the sponsor to make sure that people turn up um that the people who have been nominated as decision makers are there. You don't want somebody who misses it and then comes back and says, oh, I'm sorry, I missed the meeting, but you know, you can't do X, Y, Z, because then you lose time. And then you present at the meeting the solution, whatever the issue was that you worked on, um, the draft digitalization strategy, you're beginning to get ideas of where, how you're going to move forward. The stakeholder register will, will be useful for the next time and proposals for the next stage and then sign off. So, um, yeah, we've got about hmm, three minutes left. <laughs> so let me stop. Anything coming in on the comments or anyone open their microphone? Anyone like to add any comments? No Does questions anyone? on the chat. I think. OK. Does anyone have any comments? I mean, it would be a bit disappointing that nobody had anything to say at all. You know, does that is it new? Is it old? Is it, you know, I would expect if you're familiar with this stuff that you, 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 you'd you either agree or disagree with most of it. And there might be nuggets here and there. We'd say well, that's something that's different to the way that I would look at it, you know, so. Maybe yes, there soon I have um, I have a comment. Um, I work in in education with one of the universities and um, yeah. We had discussed moving or progressing with digitization mm. prior to COVID, but then we were forced, mm. uh, like a lot of people, to to actually make it happen mm. pretty quickly. Mm. And we went from you mentioned it before whiteboards and and yeah. we were using the butcher paper for the process maps and the workshops <laughs> and all the post-its and all that. And we actually found it quite effective to move um, directly to a digital version mm. straight off, which was mm. straight onto Visio on Teams calls just like this. Mm. Now, it does require a bit of going back around the houses to ask people to confirm because mm. when you're in a room together, you're in a workshop, you're in that environment, mm. you're totally tuned in and mm. you are putting it on that sheet of paper. Mm. People have a tendency to be more focused versus when you're remote working remotely and you're in absolutely you may yeah. have distractions either on the home yes. front or on other work things coming in pinging in so it is mm. important to circle around and just uh, ensure that you confirm when you're doing it digitally that you confirm uh, but the thing i think that we most benefited from was the transition from paper forms to digital mm. forms and mm -hmm. you mentioned it earlier on the validation mm. so um 
we used to have my long queues almost mm. uh, for new students arriving, mm. Mm. Uh, trying to get in to get help for, for this. Now they're mm. self-servicing and almost everything. So mm. it's been a huge transition and a huge um, uh, progress for us all mm. uh, in an environment where it was frowned upon for you to work at home. <laughs> now we're all doing absolutely. it. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, there's yeah. a friend of mine actually working in one of the universities and her job is actually to support students. But she's, you know, from the student viewpoint, she's at the end of a telephone, but she's actually physically at home. Yes. And um, also another, I, I supervise, I've got an MBA student in um, Bahrain and um, he, he was looking at this digitalization for banks. And basically over there, they were saying, yeah, we'll do it somewhere over the next 10 years. And then they realized that they've absolutely got to do it now, you know. Yeah. And but the process for feeding the documentation, when you have 500 students and they're all doing theses, you can't do that on paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you still have... you still need exceptions processes though, and I think if anyone was lift, listening to Joe Duffy mm. during the week, mm. uh, they were talking about seniors and and th mm. their challenges with some of the online banking requirements that are being forced upon them now. But I think, um, and even even from a student's perspective, some may not be as digitally um, adept as others. Mm. So you mm. do you do need the exceptions processes, and you need to understand mm. how. You can keep those mm. in place. Mm. But I mean, I give an example that went like that was the black and white television. They kept the system going for years because the poor people couldn't have color. Um, but actually, it would have been cheaper to 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 replace everybody's black and white television with a color television. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, yeah, and they kept yeah, the yeah. system going for you. And they did the same when the money changed. If anyone remembers the digital money, they they kept the six months going for years and years after it was gone. Yes, yes, yes. You know, so the, it's not the only way. People talk about the old people. But in, in my experience, the old people are the worst when it comes to WhatsApp and they're on it 25 times a day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is so, that is that is there. So just in, so that, uh, looking at the clock right in yeah. just of time, probably yeah. we may have to uh, switch to uh, the PMI event now. Well, may I just have two seconds to close? So sure. if you take a photograph of that page, then you, you if you give me feedback, it'd be great. And if you do, we've got some books to give away. So if you just take it and then have a look at it and link in later. And then on the, um, there's a second page, I'll put it up. Uh, I'll just show it now. Um, as I know you need to make your announcement. Yeah, this one here. Um, there are two codes here where one of them you can get a hundred euro reduction on course and another one is for 400 on PMP, by the way. So if you want that, just send me a message through, go to scatterwork.com or send me an email, you know, and I'll, I'll give you that information offline to save time. Okay, sure. so there you go. So thanks for, I, I think I've stolen a minute or two of your time, but anyway. Oh, no problem. It is, it is, it is interesting information. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Jason. Great, uh, you're welcome. Switching to the, the PMI event now, uh, I welcome the president, uh, Jackie Fagan, to address the team. It was a very timely um, uh, webinar this soon because, uh -huh. like you talk about uh, digital uh, strategy, etc. And I don't know if you read the Megatrends report, and that's one of the top ones in terms of how it's going to affect our future. Mm. I know one of the speakers mentioned about now working in a, a virtual environment so our conference is coming up guys i know one or two of you have already registered it's on the 18th of may and it's a face-to-face -face one in crow park mm. we've left the early bird open until the 3rd of uh, may you can earn eight pdus and we have a brilliant speaker lineup um, and basically it's the theme of the conference is future proofing your career through mm. the six mega trends Mm. Uh, Brezzi is uh, going to be our keynote speaker and he's going to talk about the civil movement in terms of finding peace in the chaos modern world. We have economists from the Bank of Ireland and from Central Bank. We've um, senior analysis from Gartner and um, we've got someone from the government. We've got um, the Minister of State. Uh, head of Stain Sustainability in EY. You can read the list of them. And the host for the day is Tara Lockley Grant, who is a presenter and MC. Um, so I would really encourage you, just following on from this webinar, to actually look to join us if you can on the 18th of May in uh, Crow Park. Um, definitely not one to be missed. And I know you'll come away with some takeaways. It mm. sort of follows on from what, just from what you were saying. It actually follows mm. on from especially around the digital mm. disruption. Mm. Um, 
it's it's amazing. Like these are things that are affecting us going out mm. into the future. So ways of working and all that be all different. Sure. Thank you, Santosh. Thanks a lot, Jackie. Certainly, we all look forward for this uh, attending in-person event, which is happening after a long COVID break. Certainly, looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. I all we are almost come to the end of the webinar now. You will get one PDU for attending this webinar. The PDU code is uh, claim code is shown on the screen. If you have registered with your PMI ID, then you will get this credit. Uh, uh, no accounted to your account automatically. Uh, if you have not registered with your PMI account, uh, PMI ID, you can still claim the uh, the PDUs using the claim code shown on the screen. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for your time attending the webinar today. You have a nice evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.